from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and here's what's coming up. K-State's J.P. Michaud will discuss insect management planning for this year's grain sorghum crop in view of the expectation that sorghum acreage will expand considerably in the central and southern plains this growing season. Also today, the latest edition of FSA Coffee Talk. From the Farm Service Agency, Carla Wyckoff has a full update on Conservation Reserve Program opportunities, including the latest word on the extension of that current general CRP sign-up. And further ahead on this week's wildlife management segment, K-State's Charlie Lee on new research into discouraging domestic cats from preying on backyard birds and other wildlife. All that and more right here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part. Because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You are tuned in to Agriculture Today. Thanks for listening. We will embark on another row crop production season fairly soon now. And a little on down the line, grain sorghum planting will take place. And we're visiting now with K-State research entomologist J.P. Michaud, who has been speaking with producers of late about sorghum insect pest management. J.P., not unlike with other crops that we grow in Kansas, we have quite an array of insects that can be problematic in grain sorghum here. Um, yes, and in fact, some of the ones that were previously not so much of a problem out here or up this far north are in fact uh, expanding their range of late, so that's a concern. We may have to deal with some insects we're not used to dealing with, for example, a uh, sorghum midge. Since you bring it up, what is midge and what sort of activity does it present in sorghum? Well, it's an interesting little fly. It's a tiny little fly fly, a very short-lived. You can think of hessian fly along those lines in terms of size and generation time is very fast in warm weather, so they can have many, many generations a year. Fortunately, they will never overwinter this far north. And of late, we've been seeing normally, I would say normally, uh, historically, they've only been a problem up to about you know, as far as the Oklahoma border with Kansas, so very rarely across the line we would see them. But of the past few years, we've had very sporadic and scattered, so very sporadic, but they really some economically serious losses in particular fields. And do they feed on the product itself or the foliage? What What is the exact damage they impart? Well, the, the midge females will lay their eggs right in the fertilized ovule of of the head and so in each larvae will develop in an individual seed capsule and so what you end up with is a whole bunch of seed capsules up and down the head that are just completely empty and if you get there when they're developing and they're infested you can squeeze some of them if you see some orange juice squeeze out when you squeeze those seed capsules well that was a, a midge larvae in there can they be dealt with handily then via insecticide programs or well, any they're other measures? Diffi- they're difficult to deal with because there's no rescue treatment once the eggs are laid. And so the management is to scout at flowering. Uh, you have to go out much as you would for headworms and bang heads into buckets. And they're not easy to see because they're tiny little reddish or orangish uh, midges. And they're much the same color as all the anthers that are going to fall off the flower. So you've got to look carefully in the bucket. The threshold is pretty low. One midge, one adult midge per head is justification for spraying. Of course, you're supposed to sample 50 heads or at least 10 heads in five different spots uh, in the field. The problem is that all the materials that are labeled to kill the midge are, in fact, contact insecticides. They're not any of them selective. And so the risk is always that when you spray for midge, you're going to kill beneficial insects and you have the possibility of flaring things like aphids. Now, of course, it's going to be fairly late in the crop cycle, so 
you know, the risk is, is limited. But, you know, you, we do have aphids such as sugarcane aphid and, um, and green bug, which can attack the panicle at the flowering stage and cause a lot of flower sterility or loss of yield. My concern really is that this is going to be such a sporadic problem and, you know, both from year to year and from field to field that, you know, people are not going to feel it worthwhile to go out and sample for it. And then, you know, occasionally you're going to have a nasty surprise where Mm -hmm. you lose a whole bunch of yield and you never saw it coming. The notion here is be aware of the possibility of this midge turning up. And if you're going to sample and treat, that has to happen very early in the going. Oh, absolutely. You have to get out there at anthesis, at the beginning of anthesis, and, and bang heads into a white bucket and look for those tiny little midges. They can do a tremendous amount of damage. Now, there are some resistant varieties that actually are resistant in different levels, you know, different traits, resistance to oviposition, so they deter the midges from laying eggs, but also resistance to larval development. But in these resistant varieties where they're used, you can actually raise your treatment threshold to up to five midges per head. The problem is I, I really don't know, and this would be a question for the seed suppliers, if any of those varieties would be maturity groups suitable for our, our growing region. Uh, I suspect not. So perhaps uh, one of our breeding priorities going forward, if this becomes more of a problem, will be to get midge resistance traits into some of our local varieties. A couple of more, well, let's call them customary insect pests in sorghum, want to mention them. And one would be the chinch bug. What's the latest on its likely activity? Well, we're getting more and more damage out further and further west in the through central uh, and even up north central Kansas. This has been getting sort of progressively more evident over the past five or six years. And even in the past two years, we've seen and mostly second-generation damage, but in the past two years, there's been some serious damage from first-generation chinch bugs, the ones that move out of the wheat into the sorghum adjacent to it. Well, the plants are still seedlings. Of course, they can kill a whole series of rows. Of course, they're not, uh, they can't fly yet because they're immature. They don't mature completely in the wheat, and then they march into the sorghum. And so this is something you know, that we're now seeing first-generation damage in some fields as well as the second generation. Actually, the second generation is much more difficult to control because the plants are bigger. And so these are insects that like to hide on the plant, and yet all the, all the materials labeled against them, again, are contact insecticides. So you have to hit them with it to kill them, and yet they're always hiding in behind the leaf sheaths, the panicle sheaths, and everything. And when you see all this reddening and chlorosis on the lower part of the panicle, that's because there were chinch bugs in there feeding before the panicle emerged completely. And if the, if the first-generation adults lay their eggs, what they've been doing now more and more is laying their eggs in the emerging panicle before it exerts fully. And so they feed in behind that sheath, and they can actually prevent exertion of the panicle and foul that whole head, uh, and it'll never emerge uh, properly and so very difficult to say what you could do about that for the simple reason that you're not going to be able to reach them with systemic materials. And it's uh, more often than not, you know, it's isolated along the edges of the fields and things like that. But if you see a lot of reddening, and, and of course, when there's a lot of chlorosis on the stalk, it can exacerbate lodging as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I have seen seals, though, that have been really severely affected, but usually it's only along the edges, and it's not a large proportion of heads that are affected, so. Good. One more pest we'd like to cover today, and that is the sorghum headworm. It goes by similar names, the corn earworm, the soybean podworm. You say there may well be a new control product for sorghum headworms, J.P.? And, uh, yes, and it works quite well. It's a biological. Now, to be clear, first, uh, podworms and, and so forth that you're mentioning, this is all the corn earworm. It's a pest in cotton. It's a pest in soybeans, corn, and sorghum, where we call it a headworm. But we call headworms and sorghum are actually two species, not just corn earworm, but also fall armyworm. Although I must say for the last few years, almost all ours have been corn earworm. And uh, the new product is actually a formulation of a virus that was isolated particularly from that one species, corn earworm. And they have another virus that's been isolated from fall armyworm, 
And uh, hopefully, pretty soon, they're going to formulate a combined product so that you can actually have a mix of the two viruses and kill both species of worms. Now, this is not a rescue treatment, so we don't, it, you kind of have to change your philosophy here. You're not waiting until a threshold of one or two worms per head. You've got to get out there and make a decision really early. And the first few worms you find, you have to decide, am I going to apply this as an insurance? It's more of an insurance policy. It's, it's very cost effective, and it's actually more effective than comparably priced generic materials that aren't working so well anymore against especially corn earworm. A lot of resistance in those populations. So what you're doing is you're seeding your field with a disease. And once you do that, the, the disease will self-propagate. That's why you have to get it out there early. So the, the first ones that get infected die with billions of little virus particles. And so the other insects that walk over that will help passively or actively vector it through the field. And we've even found uh, in our control plots that those insects are capable of moving the disease from one field to another. We can find disease library in the neighboring field where we didn't apply it. It's really uh, a good product, very selective, so you're not going to disrupt biological control of your other pests. And, and this product is registered also for use on soybeans. Well, producers, we've offered an assortment of things for you to think about in advance of the grain sorghum production season in as far as insect management goes. Uh, K-State, of course, has accumulated a great deal of information on these pests and uh, how to deal with them. So reference that and uh, our entomology team here at K-State as well, including JP, for further input as you get into that growing season. JP, thanks for the quick overview of all of this. We appreciate it, and we'll talk again soon. My pleasure is always there. That's J.P. Michaud, research entomologist for K-State. J.P. is based at the university's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes. And we'll return with more on agriculture today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128-plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back to Agriculture Today and our time set aside every other week to fill you in on the latest from your Farm Service Agency State Headquarters for Kansas. We call this session FSA Coffee Talk and doing the honors this time around an agricultural program specialist with the Kansas FSA, Carla Wyckoff. On quite a smorgasbord of things that we'll get into here today, Carla, several dates and deadlines and assorted details that producers will want to know about. Let's start with this one for there's a deadline coming up two weeks from tomorrow, the 31st of March, on marketing assistance loans. Uh, right, Eric, on marketing assistance loans, which we call, you know, we use initials a lot, so MALs, those are nine-month commodity loans. And uh, with some of the new COVID rules, they have extended those loans to a 12-month loan um, automatically on there. But just want to let you know today that uh, March 31st is the last day to get a marketing assistance loan for 2020 program year. And you still have to have control and title of the grain in order to get this loan. But you have till March 31st to get a 2020 program year loan on wheat, barley, oats, and canola. And uh, marketing assistance loans has a pretty low interest rate, too. The March rate right now is 2.125%. So just wanted to let everybody know that that March 31st deadline is coming up. It's often looked at as a source of short-term financing for producers, so be aware of that. The marketing assistance loan. Spending some time, though, Carla, on various facets of the Conservation Reserve Program. That general sign-up, it was supposed to end, but uh, the deadline was extended. Right, Eric. Sign-up started January 4th, and it was supposed to end on February 12th, but they extended that deadline. Now, at this point right now, we don't know what that deadline is. They just said extended until further notice. 
Uh, one of the items that they talked about was that the new administration wanted to review some of the conservation policy out there and make a determination if there were any changes that were needed. We haven't heard on that yet, and we don't have a deadline on that yet. But county offices are continuing to take general CRP offers for anybody that's interested in going into that program. They can contact their local FSA office and set up an appointment to sign up in that program. So we haven't stopped taking the offers. We're, we're continuing to do that, but we just don't have a deadline at this point for that program. And the general sign up this time, much as similar general CRP enrollment periods in the past, the criteria are likened to those previous. Yes, right, right now they're, everything's the same at this point right now. It's a competitive process, general sign up. They have a period of time of taking the offers, once the sign-up's over, then the national office uh, reviews all those offers in the, U- in the U.S., and they set a level of the environmental benefit points that each offer receives based on cover and the type of land that they're offering. That happens after the end of sign-up. They look at those, those numbers and make a determination which offers will be accepted. So we're down the road from that just a little bit yet because we don't have a deadline, but That kind of moves me into the next, the CRP Grasslands sign-up. It was supposed to start on March 15th, but right now they've delayed that sign-up because of the extension in the general CRP sign-up. They didn't want to have both of those sign-ups going on at the same time. So the grassland CRP will occur. Yes, it will occur. Yes, they will have the CRP grassland sign-up, but the start of that sign-up has been delayed until after the general sign-up is over. So we expect information anytime on that. Uh, Of course, we like to hear on the general, too, here pretty soon. Another thing I kind of wanted to talk about today, the CRP maintenance letters. The county offices will be sending out the annual reminder to producers of what their responsibilities for maintaining that CRP cover. So when you sign up into CRP, you're signing to maintain that cover at a certain level. So this letter is just a reminder of several different things. Each county can add some different options within that letter for things that might be going on in their county. One thing that that is in there is for maintaining that cover and removing any trees or brush that's in that CRP uh, that's on a grass cover. It's a grass practice, I guess, is, is what it would be. If it's a grass practice, we don't want trees growing right. up in it. So and That's the responsibility producers yes. need to routinely take care of. Right. Among others, right? Right. And there's some other things in there, too, like controlling the existence and spread of noxious weeds. So we just recommend that anyone that has some concerns in that area to contact the Natural Resource Conservation Service. They're in our offices with FSA and our service center. They're our technical provider for CRP, so they can help. Or you can contact your county weed department for any kind of assistance that you have uh, with any concerns with noxious weeds and also non-noxious weeds. You want to control those also. Also in the spotlight, haying and grazing options for CRP. And that's likely stemming from the recent rains, notwithstanding the ongoing dryness in parts of Kansas, Carla. Right. We're fortunate to get those rains. You bet. uh, We have several counties in Kansas, kind of along the north border and the west border, that are counties that are already eligible for emergency grazing and emergency haying. There's all kinds of different options within the emergency grazing and haying of CRP acreage. Just to give you a, a couple of the examples, don't want to go too far in the weeds for this, but emergency grazing, uh, if it's done outside the primary nesting season, which for Kansas, that's April 15th through July 15th, they can emergency graze on all practice acreage on that CRP contract. There's no payment reduction. doesn't cost them anything if they're an emergency county. And it's on all CRP practices. Uh, one thing to note there is in the past, there w- it was a very limiting factor on some of the practices that we had in Kansas were not eligible to hay or graze. And they've opened that up quite a bit. 
They do um, have a requirement that you can uh, graze up to 90 days during the program year. Now, that's contingent on the cover that's out there. So you have to have a modified conservation plan in order to do hang and grazing. You also have to visit the office and make application for this. There's forms that you have to sign out, of course, and those have to be done before you can take any action out on the ground. But one thing I do want to note is this 2018 Farm Bill added within there on emergency grazing that if you were a livestock forage program county that had been approved for that, which right now all the counties that are approved for emergency are also uh, livestock forage program counties. In those cases, you can only, the eligible acreage on the contract is 50% of the normal carrying capacity. So they're limiting a little bit more on those Of course, that's because there's drought conditions in that area. Also, no payment reduction. There's no payment reduction on there. And still the same requirements of it's all CRP practices and you're limited up to those 90 days. And that 90 days is the maximum. So based on the conditions of the specific CRP, based on the conservation plan, there may be a limiting factor there for those. Once more, applying to emergency haying and grazing, the counties that have been approved for those alternatives roughly resting in the northern couple of tiers of counties and the western tiers of counties in Kansas touch base with your local FSA office to identify if you're in one of those counties, first of all, and to actually pursue the process. And Carla, we'll finish with this. There is the alternative of non-emergency grazing of CRP, and you might remind us of the stipulations attached to that. Okay. On non-emergency grazing, actually there's some options. So I would encourage you to visit with your local office if you're interested in hanging grazing. There's quite a few different rules along this process, and so it's hard to spell out every situation. So the very best thing you can do is visit with your county office and get the rules for what you're wanting to do and what you're eligible for. But like Eric said, the counties that are not in the emergency eligible counties, there is an option of non-emergency hang and grazing. The thing about that is that there is a payment reduction, a 25% payment reduction on there. And there's limiting factors on frequency within the non-emergency, such as emergency grazing outside the nesting, Um, You can only do that every other year. Uh, Non-emergency, you get a little more time. Under the grazing, you can't exceed 120 calendar days. And you can't begin before March 1st, and you can't graze any later than November 1st. So there's some limiting factors in there. So just some options out there that are in addition to what we've had in the past. You know, through the years, there's been different rules with hanging grazing, and so they've lightened up a few of the things I say lightened up, you know, how we are. We exchange one rule for another <laughs> rule, too. So. But there's more flexibility yeah, right. is the there's point. there's more flexibility, definitely. Once more, it's important to get the particulars on anything we've talked about today by having a conversation with your local FSA personnel. They can sort out how any of these would apply to your situation and how you might qualify and apply. So talk with those folks. Carla, thanks for the update on all of this. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. On the latest FSA Coffee Talk, that's Carla Wyckoff, Agricultural Program Specialist with the Farm Service Agency State Headquarters for Kansas, right here in Manhattan. We'll return with more after the break. You're listening to Agriculture Today. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and next up for you, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, in its weekly Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report, the USDA tells us that for the week ending this past Sunday, our topsoil moisture supplies had improved notably from last week. Now 14% surplus, 62% adequate, 24% short to very short. Subsoil moisture this week called 6% surplus, 59% adequate, and 35% still short to very short. And the condition of the winter wheat crop in Kansas this week is at 38% good to excellent, 40% fair, and 22% poor to very poor, according to the National Agricultural Statistics Service, USDA. The U.S. Supreme Court on April the 27th will hear refiners' appeal of the Tenth Circuit Court ruling that invalidated three small refinery exemptions. The decision relates to the refiners' appeal of the ruling that said in order to be granted SREs, the refiners needed to have obtained those continuously from 2010 forward. The EPA recently came out in favor of the court ruling and said it it will not act on the pending SREs until after the Supreme Supreme Court issues its decision on the matter. EPA data as of late February showed 20 so-called gap year SREs were pending, covering 2011 to 2018 compliance years, with another 30 pending for the 2019 compliance year and 16 pending for the 2020 compliance year. Expectations are if the Supreme Court sides with the 10th Circuit ruling, it would dramatically reduce the granting of small refinery exemptions. Moving forward. Except for one dairy product category, most milk product and class prices were increased from the previous month in the USDA's latest dairy forecast. Here's more on that from the USDA's Rod Bain. There were relatively small changes to USDA's March milk production and export forecast. This is World Agricultural Outlook Board Chair Mark Jekinowski. In terms of production, we have some kind of offsetting factors, higher cow numbers, but that's being offset by lower milk per cow. But our forecast for 2021 would be about 4.1 billion pounds higher than what we achieved in 2020. In terms of dairy trade, we reduced our fat basis import forecast a bit, raised our fat basis export forecast a bit. In terms of skim solid basis product, we lowered our export forecast a bit. And as for dairy price forecasts this month, changes we made this month are all on the upside. With all products except cheese noting a price increase and all classes of milk recording a month over month rise in prices as well. The all milk price forecast we raised by 60 cents per hundred weight to $17.75 per hundred weight. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And following that, right on cue, we'll hand it on over now to K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook for this week's edition of Milk Lines. Mike? Today, as funny as it seems, I'd like to talk to our Kansas dairy producers about heat stress. seems as though the weather the last few weeks has had us more concerned about cold stress and automatically we seem to be headed toward some issues with heat stress. And actually on some of our dairy farms, we probably are experiencing some heat stress, particularly in the afternoons, with the temperatures rising 75 to 80 degrees to even a little bit warmer in some parts of the state. So where do we think about this and what should we be paying attention to? Well, the first thing you should pay attention to is the holding pin. You see, in the afternoons when we pack those animals in there, we're restricting them generally to about 16 square foot per animal. So they're packed pretty closely together. And with afternoon highs running 75 to 80 degrees, depending on how long they're in that holding pin, good chance that they're starting to warm up in there. And that the actual holding pin temperatures, if you measured them, are quite a bit different than what you would maybe find outside, particularly in the area that the animal is actually spending her time. So what do you need to do to help your herd out? Well, number one, if you have uh, sidewalls that you can open up, open those up. Yes, I understand you may still have to close them up for night as we see temperatures falling into the 30s, but in the afternoon when we have these warmer temperatures, it's really important to get those sidewalls open. Many of you have fans in your holding pin, or if you don't, you should have, so those fans should be maintenanced. It's really important that we do our regular maintenance on these fans 
keeping in mind that when we have fans that are very dirty, it's about a 30% reduction in the amount of air that will actually flow through that fan. So it is a significant increase in energy costs for the actual airspeed that you create with that fan. Now, you need to think also about when you might want to turn those on. In the holding pin, maybe we want to turn those on at 55 degrees or maybe even 60 degrees. You need to probably turn them on at a lower temperature because the animals are more likely to experience heat stress in that area. What is the disadvantage of heat stress or increases in body temperature, for example, when we're in the holding pen? Well, it's going to decrease the reproductive efficiency of our dairy animals. It's going to decrease milk production and decrease feed consumption. Therefore, we've got some really important reasons why we need to pay a little bit of attention as we get these warm afternoons. Don't just dismiss them. Go out there, take some action to help your animals better survive the heat stress that they might experience in your milking parlor holding pen. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. And this added note from the Animal Sciences and Industry Department here at K-State. Applications are now available for the 2021 K-State Animal Science Leadership Academy. It's set for June the 15th through the 18th. This year's program will offer a hybrid format of virtual instruction, then followed by a closing one-day in-person experience here on the K-State campus. Students will participate in tours and workshops virtually on Tuesday the 15th through Thursday the 17th of June, and then again gathering on the campus Friday, June the 18th. Participation is limited to 20 students to ensure individualized attention from the counselors, the professors, and industry leaders. Transportation to and from the event, the responsibility of the participant. Otherwise, all costs have been generously provided by the Livestock Meat Industry Council. To find out more information about registering for the 2021 K-State Animal Science Leadership Academy in June, Go to asi.ksu.edu, and you'll find a link to the Academy details right there. Again, asi.ksu.edu. We'll step aside for one more break and then return with more for you here on the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Next on Agriculture Today, wildlife management. With Charlie Lee aboard with us, former wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Charlie, in the past, we have discussed the impact of feral cats, cats in the wild, on various wildlife species. But another angle here on domesticated cats and their predatory tendencies on wildlife. This was the subject of a recent study, which we'll talk of. But yes, there is an effect there for sure. Yes, it's long been known that predation by domestic cats is a threat to biodiversity conservation. There's certainly different levels and a lot of studies that have looked at this issue. It's a very complex issue with a lot of social attitudes that play a large part in potential solutions to this issue. There's certainly a debate about the extent of cat predation, whether it's compensatory or additive to the natural mortality that exists when you have a domesticated animal that roams free at times. Uh, We know that there are some impacts besides the direct impacts of predation. It can also affect bird productivity. It can cause reductions in nest provisioning rates. It can make lower bird abundances where cat densities are high. And those large increases in nest predation by other predators then are more severe at the same time. Unless cats are kept as a pest controller or a rodent controller, owners rarely consider that killing wild animals is acceptable. But folks that have cats that are proud of their actions in taking wildlife also must consider some of the species that are also valuable 
uh, out there that those domesticated cats may take. So some owners then try to completely or partially restrict uh, outdoor access or attempt to impede or inhibit their hunting with the addition of bells on their collars or other collar-mounted devices uh, with various degrees of success. And they can use the excuses that hunting is a natural component of cat behavior and it might or might not be perceived as a threat to those domesticated cats' uh, welfare or safety. These might successfully slow down some of the hunting behavior, but they don't really repress the cat's instinct or the tendency or that desire to hunt. That's a, an innate behavior that seems to be very persistent and even though it might be effective uh, to have a permanent confinement, it's very unpopular. Consequently, it doesn't happen frequently enough to, to reduce these significant losses to birds and mammals. And when it, just to put it in perspective again, it's been estimated that we're losing 2.5 billion birds per year in the United States alone and perhaps three times that many mammals. That's a tremendous amount of wildlife that's disappearing. And some are consumed by cats. Some are just killed by cats. But we're also losing future reproduction with the cat killing as many animals as they do. Well, this new research highlights different mitigation strategies that hopefully will reduce that predation then? Yes, this was a study published in Current Biology where they recruited cat owners that had cats that regularly hunted and captured wild animals and then brought those back to the house. It was done in the uh, UK and it was a before and after control impact study. They looked at several treatments. They equipped some cats with collars uh, with a bell or with a collar called Bird's Be Safe collar cover along with three novel measures. One would be providing food in a puzzle-type feeder so that the cat had to spend some time trying to get the feed out of the feeder. And then there was a provision of a commercial grain-free food uh, in which meat was the principal source of protein. And then another treatment was a 5 to 10 minutes daily object play plus the control group. So those were the the treatments. Uh, Then it was involved 212 households in England that owned 355 cats. It was a 12-week trial, and the results were, to me, amazing. In terms of reducing predation, then, were any of these methods actually successful? Well, relative to the control and the pretreatment period, the total numbers of animals per cat were significantly reduced in households in the food treatment where these cats were then fed a meat protein food diet. That was reduced by 36%. Those households that increased the amount of play just 5 to 10 minutes, that reduced by 25%. Conversely, in the households that had the puzzle treatment, that increased numbers by 33%. It seems that that frustrated cats and gave them the desire to go out and and hunt. But the other treatments that are there, the ones with just the uh, bell and the bird be safe treatments had no effects at all on total prey. So there are no surefire remedies for domestic cat predation on birds and other animals. Well, there are. It's just not socially <laughs> acceptable to keep them permanently in, enclosed, and right. that's the the issue. There is a solution. It just does not seem to be an acceptable one to domestic cat owners. Some of the other techniques that are out there appear to be not providing much success. This at least offers a couple of new options by changing diet and changing cat activity by increasing their playtime. Once more, that is a look at domestic cats, their predation tendencies, and how they can impact wildlife, and some new thoughts on trying to reduce that impact. And Charlie, thanks for the glance at that. Charlie Lee, former wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension there.
Our time's away for today. Previewing tomorrow's broadcast, we'll take up more row crop weed management matters of interest with K-State's Sarah Lancaster. And from the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McGowan rejoins us, this time with tax considerations when selling farm business assets. Those topics and more on tomorrow's broadcast. Please be back with us right here for that then. Meantime, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.